Here on the Believe in NFL Draft Prospects podcast, I'm Joe DeLeon, joined by my co-host Ryan Roberts. Today, we're going to have some fun. We're going to be debunking and breaking down, or so reacting to some of the craziest hot takes that we received from some of our listeners and some of Ryan Roberts' followers. We also might, at the end, share some of our own hot takes for the class. Uh, folks, though, before we get to that, make sure you head on over to betonline.ag which is your go-to source for all of your sports betting needs with all the updated odds, news, anything that you need for sports betting. NHL, NBA, college, basketball. I know you're bored during the offseason, so make sure you head on over there. Have some fun before football gets back. I'm sure, actually, you could probably bet on some of these XFL games, which because they have, frankly, anything that you can bet on at Bet Online. Uh, make sure you use our promo code BELIEVE50 to get your 50% welcome bonus. On your first deposit, bet online where the game starts. All right, Ryan, uh, the wheels might get might fall off of this show pretty quick with some of these pretty obnoxious hot takes that we have. And honestly, your your followers came through. Listeners of the show came through by posting some pretty crazy shit. <laughs> some pretty, a lot of- pretty great. There, by the first of all, there are a lot of people yeah. who commented hot takes that are like. No, those are kind of reasonable. So we didn't pick all yes. of them. There were 30 comments uh, on your tweet, 36 actually, plus some of the quote tweets. But yep. the ones we picked are are pretty pretty wild. Yeah, man. Now I was actually very happy, man. I I didn't know what the uh, I didn't know what the response would be to that tweet. To be honest, I thought there'd be a couple, but like like you said, there were a lot of hot takes to sort through, man. And some of them were very hot. Like, like Hades hot, man. It was, uh, yeah, a couple of these are like, eh, I don't know if I want to talk about this on a live show, but we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Yeah. Uh, the first one, though, is one that I, I, I keep seeing pop up and it popped up at the beginning of the cycle. And the crazy part about this one is it's getting peddled a little bit by some national media outlets. So I, I think it's a good note to start us off on because I think this one's possible, but I think it's highly unrealistic. And it's the one that you keep seeing is that people are saying, that the Chicago Bears are going to trade Justin Fields and that they're going to draft the quarterback first overall with the top pick. And I posted a video on the channel, on the Hack City channel, breaking this down and why, frankly, it's it's really stupid. It, just from a <laughs> team building perspective, from Dude, that is great analysis right there. It's really stupid. I love but, it. But uh, I'm, I'm not gonna it. sit here and overanalyze it. It's yeah. really, really stupid for you, it to happen. You know, I was Joe, I was asked about it on a Chicago Bears podcast, though. So, like, this is a real topic in the Bears set side of the media, which is really uh, funny. And I don't understand why it should even be brought up. The kid has played – not the kid, he's my age. The guy has played two years as the starting quarterback for the Chicago Bears, which of, one yep. of which was his rookie year not his full season. He rushed for a historic rushing total, which is separate because – that's not the most important stat for a quarterback, sure. but we're in the second year of the new regime, the third year going into things for Justin Fields. He's still developing. He's still improving. And, and he, he got a lot better in his second year too, right? Like he showed a lot. I, I think that people have kind of qualified him as just like this, you know, just, he's just a running quarterback and he doesn't have any passing skills. I'm like, eh, he showed a lot of growth as a passer in year two compared to the year one. Like it's developing. There's, there's some hope there. Yeah. There's some hope. But the last part of this, though, that Ryan, that I think needs to be paid attention to is who's he throwing the ball to and who the hell is blocking for him? Their offensive line's gotten a little bit better, but the emphasis this offseason, I don't care what happens really much on defense. You got to get the guy weapons. You got to get the guy a little bit of extra protection. And again, there's some positive pieces there, but like, you know, Chase Claypool can't do everything. And we, we clearly know that he's not like a prime you know, 1500 yard type receiver. He's a good receiver, but they need to add other guys into the fold. Otherwise nothing's going to improve. Let's pay attention to the the real issue at hand, get the guy some weapons, get him some protection, setting things over and restarting the clock is going to be so detrimental. Joe, they traded the 32nd overall pick for chase Claypool, man. That's the bigger issue. They did that. That's insane, man. I mean, desperate. I mean, th- that reminds me of like, remember when Muhammad Sanu was traded to the Patriots for a second round oh pick? It's God. like, what are we doing, man? What are we doing? But you're, I mean, look, this was my, this was my conversation about this on the, that Chicago Bears podcast was 
Do I technically have Bryce Young rated higher than I had Justin Fields coming out? I do. But I don't think that it's such a big difference that you mortgage the development you've already had to reset the clock because the roster yeah. sucks. It's not yeah. a good roster right now. It's not like if I if, – look, if the roster was like borderline pretty good, maybe playoff caliber with a couple pieces, right? And the only difference was Justin Fields isn't that guy and Bryce Young might be that guy. Then you make that move. But you're either way, next year, you're probably going five and 12, six and mm -hmm. 11. Like you're not going to be a good football team. That's just point blank period to it, unless there's a lot of roster turnover and a lot of hits this offseason. So you're not going to be a good football team. So Bryce Young is not a big separator this year from Justin Fields. And you still have three years of control on Justin Fields, too. You have that fifth year option as well if you will choose to use that. So I don't think resetting the clock is the, is the wise notion here because I don't think that roster is ready to compete for anything substantial no and the last little bit here if we just look at some of the teams in the past how they've built their rosters some of the most successful rebuilds have been through trading back and acquiring picks and i think many would argue you're in a very unique situation to trade back get a lot of picks for the future to continue to build this roster and even if justin fields doesn't become a top 10 quarterback if he's good enough to be top 15, top 18, somewhere in that range, if yeah. you use all those picks to build around him, things can be very, very, you know, turn around very, very quickly. There's a very good chance of that. But you're in a more unique situation to trade back rather than to draft a quarterback when I think we all agree that there's no consensus on who the top guy is. Well, Joe, Joe can I ask you this? Because I think we've learned in the draft sphere that yeah. – Nothing's impossible, right? I mean, I don't think that this is the wise thing to do, and I don't think it ultimately happens. I think that the Bears trade out when it's all said and done, and to get you know to get that draft capital and to continue to build that and to hopefully replace that early second round pick for Chase Claypool that I just kind of yeah. keep on a harping on because it was awful. But at the end of the day. NFL teams have done dumber things, right? Like there have been some chaos in the past. Uh, I guess my question is, yeah. what percentage of a chance do you think it is that Justin Fields is not on the Bears next year? Can, can, can I flip it on you? How dumb yes. do you think the Bears are? <laughs> I don't know what to think about polls yet as a poll. I don't know how to pronounce his name, the general manager. I don't know, man. I mean, I, it's, it's a little bit of a cop-out, but I don't know enough about him. And then you're talking about a, a coach that was only a first-year coach this year as yeah. well. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't think they're that stupid. So I'm giving it like a 1% a chance. I think oh, it's, you're that low. I'm going to say like very five, unlikely. 5%. Be, yeah. Yeah. Be, because I, I would, we're, we're I would off. argue, I, I would argue though, Ryan, that if you trade Justin Fields and he ends up being really good and mm -hmm. then you just mess up the clock and the timeline that you already have, that would be worse for your situation as a GM and a head coach. Like it would be more fireable if he ends up being good than yeah. if you pass on Bryce Young or CJ Stroud. Um, but we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Hopefully that you'll be great. You'll be great if they uh if they trade just the fields and they draft Will Levis number one. That would be even oh better. I oh yeah. I would be at, so out on the Chicago Bears and I absolutely pray that that, <laughs> that does not happen. Uh, Ryan the second one that we had is a bit of a two parter. I combined two of the takes that we had so the two pieces here are one that no receivers will go in the first round. And then two, Zay flowers will be the first wide receiver selected. So Ryan, here's what I see for, for this. I don't think that's likely that there's going to be no receivers selected in the first round. This one's a little more tame. You can make the argument for it. Um, but I just think that there are a lot of receiver needy teams on the back half of the first round. And I actually could see a run. Like I could see a run of, a JSN, a Jordan Addison, a Quentin Johnson. If guys fall, that's more realistic. If guys fall to the back end of 2025, and then we have like a run of three, four receivers go because guys don't want to miss out or teams don't want to miss out on their guy. Zay sure. Flowers, though, I think is unique, uh, but I don't know if I'm willing to go that far to say he's, he's a first-round pick. I think he's a little more early to mid-second for me. I mean, that's where I have him graded as well. I really like Zay a lot. I mean, yeah. I think we did one mock draft maybe in the preseason where I had him in like the 20s or like pick 30 or something. Like, like he's a really good player in my opinion. At the end of the day, I do not have a first-round grade on any of these wide receivers. I don't have a first-round grade. Wow. I, high seconds, like sure. There's a lot of second-round picks, I think, in this year's wide receiver class. 
I don't think there's foregone conclusions at wide receiver one. I just don't see it. Ultimately, the NFL loves drafting receivers, though. They love drafting speed. And that's one thing that's in this class is that you do have speed, right? Zay Flowers is going to run fast. Josh Downs is probably going to run fast. Jalen Hyatt from Tennessee is probably going to run fast. Quentin Johnson, for his size, is probably going to run pretty fast. You do have some speed. So there's going to be multiple receivers drafted in the first round. Should it be that way? I would argue that maybe there shouldn't be, right? Like, I think the take makes sense from that department. But from the logistical sense, I do think that there's a couple of receivers drafted in the first round. The Zay Flowers one's interesting, Joe. It is, mm. though, man. Because I think that the combine is going to be the big separator at wide receiver this year. I do. I think there's going to be a lot of guys that are packed pretty close together. If you see a Zay Flowers pop off a 4-3-3, let's say, right? Mm. You're like, oh, someone uh, could do it, man. They could pull the trigger. I wouldn't say that that's unrealistic. I really wouldn't. Yeah, I again, I don't think it's unrealistic, which is why I, I, I brought it up and I included it. But the, the, to react to the 40-time comment, though, yeah. if he runs a 4-3-3, he apparently it, it, has run a four three two ish somewhere in that ballpark in the past. I, I so. mean that number is impressive, but at the same time, I don't think I'd be shocked. I'd be like, yeah, that's what I thought he was going to run. You know, I think that maybe the general public would be excited over that, but I don't know if that would really move him up or down for me because, like, again, I know that he's really fast. I'd be more concerned if he doesn't run in those low four threes because he's he's small. He's a smaller receiver, and again, he yep. shows that speed all the time on tape. Yeah. I, I, I'm interested to see the Jalen Hyatt conversation a little bit from yes. Tennessee because he is a guy that I think everyone knows is fast. I mean, you could have watched Tennessee this year and been like, yep, that guy's really fast. But <laughs> he's a guy that was a late riser onto the scene this season. You didn't talk anything you – know, like we didn't talk about Jalen Hyatt at all entering this year. It was all Cedric Tillman, and for good reason. Right. Tillman's a good football player. He's going to be a very solid day two pick in my opinion. But Hyatt brings next-level speed, and I feel like the media – is going to start catching up to what the NFL's opinion is on him. So could he be the first wide receiver taken? I mean, the NFL always values speed. I mean, we're yes. only a few years away from Henry Ruggs being drafted before CD right. Lamb, Jerry Judy. Like, it's happened, man. It's happened a lot. Yeah, we, we just think back to all the top guys that have been selected. It's it's a lot of speed. So I think that there's certainly a possibility. I don't think this is unrealistic, uh, either of these things. Well, actually, the Zay Flowers one's more realistic the no receivers one, I think, is is relatively uh, I agree. realistic. Uh, now we've got some thoughts on tight ends, Ryan. So uh, this is another yeah. two-parter. Purdue tight end Payne Durham is a top five tight end in this class. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Luke Musgrave <laughs> is tight end one and ends up going top 20 is the second part here. So uh, Payne Durham's fine. Like I talked about how <laughs> He looked good on day three of the senior bowl, but the dude's slow. The dude's really, really slow. And I think it's yep. like a day three pick. Someone snatches him up and you get a good blocking tight end that can have some impact uh, in the red zone as your second or third tight end on the roster. But, oh, God, please. No, he is not a. There's some good tight ends in this class. There's some really good tight ends in this class. Can we please not <laughs> not, not throw pain Durham in there? <laughs> you know, you know what's oh. a shame about a shame shame about this class, Joe, is that I feel like the constant annoyance of Michael Mayer being undervalued and jockeying some guys up at the top of the class that I feel like aren't necessarily shouldn't be in that conversation is that we are losing the sight of like. This is a really good tight end class. It actually is, right? You yeah. have one elite player at the top, in my opinion. You have a bunch of good football players, man. Like, if I, if you told me in the second round I got Tucker Craft or Darnell Washington or uh, Dalton Kincaid or, you know, Luke Musgrave even in the right situation, like, I'd be like, that's cool, man. That's a lot of upside with that pick. Like, I like that, right? You can get behind it because you're like, there's athletic upside. There's just, there's projectability there. Mm. And we're losing the sight that it is a really good class because there's just so many back and forth conversations. But I just named part of the reason why I say that this is a, a ludicrous take. It's a little ludicrous, in my opinion. Yeah, you just Payne named Dorham. a bunch of guys that are like, yes, oh, I just named a just bunch a of guys that I would take before Payne Dorham. <laughs> yeah, Payne exactly. Dorham, to your point, it's going to be a really good part of a tight end room. Really good part. It's going to block his butt off. Cool. He's got a massive catch radius, over 80-inch wingspan. That's fantastic. He's going to be a red zone weapon. That's great, man. Like, he reminds me of Matt Spate. You remember Matt Spate that used to yeah. play with the Pittsburgh Steelers? Like, really good number <laughs> two tight end, man. Yeah. Really good. And then in the red zone, you had to keep your eyes on him because, like, he's massive. He's got a huge frame. 
But at the end of the day, we're a couple weeks away from Indianapolis here, or actually like a week away from Indianapolis starting. And Payne Durham is going to run like 485. I want people to be aware of that. That's going to happen. He is not fast. He's 260 pounds, so there's some context. But he's not a great athlete. He's a big guy, massive frame, try-hard blocker, plays physically. There's a lot to like about Payne Durham, but he is not a top-five tight end in this class. The Luke Musgrave take, though, I, it's not like the Zay Flowers one where we can sit here and say, yeah, I can kind of see it. It has nothing to do with Luke Musgrave. It has everything to do with Michael Mayer. And we said this already on a recent show. Actually, it was last week we did the show. Why is everybody overthinking Michael Mayer? It doesn't make any sense to me. I keep seeing too many people on Twitter that aren't necessarily draft analysts, but like people who cover teams that are doing film evaluations to have grades on players, which, you know, I commend them for doing that because there's a lot of people that don't and just spout shit. But Michael Mayer is so talented. I don't understand how you, you can't watch the kid and think, wow, this guy has, you know, rare athleticism for a guy his size and is ready to step in and provide an impact immediately. I know that it is it is overly thrown out there, and it's a very easy name to throw out there for tight ends. But this is the closest thing that we've had to Gronk in since Gronk retired. I can't think of another tight end that has come into the league that has been that closely comparable to Rob Gronkowski, where he can block his butt off, he provides a, a, aggression and and tenacity to blocking, and then on top of that, just is a great receiver, really good hands, a good route yeah. runner. By year two, I really do think that that Michael Mayer is going to be in the discussion as one of the top tight ends in the NFL. I, I think that that needs to be recognized more, and not enough people are doing it. He's a top 10 player in the class for me, regardless of positional value. We talked yeah. about that. Joe, I think that this is one of those situations, and I was talking to someone about this on Twitter, I think, the other day, that there's some prospects that go through the analysis paralysis thing, right? Where it's just like, you've been talking about Michael Mayer? Since he was a freshman in college, you've been talking about him forever. For three years, we've been talking about Michael Mayer. He's the next big thing. He's baby Gronk. He's this, he's that. And people lose sight of the fact that, like, dude is still really good. You just don't talk about him as much because you've already talked about him a million different times, right? So you start yeah. losing focus of just how good he is. Literally, Joe, I've seen in mock drafts from reputable people, by the way. I've now seen Michael Mayer as the first tight end off the board. I've now seen Darnell Washington. I've seen Dalton Kincaid. And I've also seen Luke Musgrave. I've seen four different tight ends. I think it's ludicrous. I think it's it's silly. At the end of the day, I think Michael Mayer will be the first tight end off the board. I do believe that. Is there a realm of possibility where he's not? I guess so. I mean, the talking heads are telling you that it's possible. So I guess you have to listen to them, right? I don't think it's going to be Luke Musgrave, though. I think it's going to go one of three ways. Either you do the right thing and you look at the full resume and you say, Michael Mayer is the best tight end in this class. It's not really close. Or you look at, wow, look at that big dude from Georgia, Darnell Washington. Look at that frame, dude. And you fall in love with the body and the blocking and cool. Or you look at Dalton Kincaid and say, oh, he had the most productive season kind of, right? And he's a yeah. little more fluid. He's kind of a detached player. And that's your style. So I do think there's a world where there's another tight end taken before Michael Mayer. I think it's ridiculous if it happens. But I do think there's that world. But I don't think the world involves Luke Musgrave, truly. I just don't. No. I mean, because... Joe, he might run 4-4 four, four something at the combine, but it doesn't change the fact that he played in two football games this year. And before the season, he was looked at as a developmental tight ends with upside. Cool. Weird. But he's not going to play in line. He's not going to have nuance as a pass catcher. And he's very, he's very stiff, man. He's a linear player. The linear stuff is exciting. But I mean, he's for me, like this, Mike is a, this is Mike Gasicki. It is Mike Gasicki. Yeah. That's exactly who he reminds me of. Yep. Yeah, we got to calm down a little bit on the tight end takes, folks. And the person who commented this, it's no, it's no knock on on you, but it's just because it's everybody. It's everybody's yeah. talking about this, and it just it seems like the trendy thing to do is to bash Michael Mayer. And we're we're gonna stay pat here. We're not gonna overthink things. Michael Mayer's a really good player. There were a lot of positive Michael Mayer comments that like the Patriots were gonna take him, the Packers were gonna take him, which that would be really scary if he ended up on either of those teams, especially if Aaron Rodgers stays with the Packers. All right, here's the next one I got for you, yes. Ryan. Uh, we've got uh, three more that we're going to get to, and then we each are going to pitch one of our own. Okay. Uh, this one's going to be really quick. Tank Dell is a first-round wide receiver. No. <laughs> no. I Joey, watched the kid in Mobile. 
that's not a first round receiver. And there are, we just talked about how there is going to be a potential drop for a lot of these guys. And most of them are graded as early second round picks. So if that then means that's the case, where the hell does tank Dell fit in here? Is he wide receiver one all of a sudden? No, stop it. Please just no. (laughs) Joe, Joe, we do this every year, man. I was talking to someone like we literally did this last year with who was the Memphis receiver last year? The small kid. Uh, Calvin Austin, Calvin Austin. We did this with Calvin Austin last year at the senior bowl where we're like, he's uncoverable. Yeah. He's 165 pounds. And he's in waiting at one drills. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little one drill. Exactly. We uh, did this with Andy Isabella. We did. We've done this a lot of different times, man, with a lot of different of these small receivers that can uncover against man coverage one-on-one, but you know what they can't do. They can't work against contact. They can't fight off physicality. They can't do those types of things. Look, Tank Dell is a good little gadgety type of slot receiver at the next level. I think in rounds three through five, like, cool, man. That's awesome. Good. Get Tank Dell. But I think Tank Dell is not incredibly fast. That's the biggest misconception, yes. I think, with him is that I don't think he's fast. I think he's going to run like four or five flat at 165 pounds. Incredibly quick, though. He's going to run an incredible that three cone. He's going to really run a really good 20 yard shuttle. What's that? That would be really slow if he ran four or five. It's 165 pounds. Joe's, I don't think he's fast, man. I think he's incredibly quick twitch, great out of breaks, instant acceleration. All those things are awesome. I don't think he's a burner like some people project. Like I just don't see it on film with him mm. in that regard. But regardless, I think he could find a role at the next level. I think he could be a solid third, fourth option in a passing game. But he's not a first-round pick. He's not a first-round receiver. He's not. I mean, it's just – it's. It's one of those recency bias where you saw him at the at the senior bowl against some a less than stellar senior bowl cornerback group and even working against some safeties at times. And it's just like that's not transla- that's not fully translatable. Those yeah. drills are made for wide receivers to win. He won. Congratulations, but it's not translatable to the next level. Yeah. First round talent, a little too spicy for us. Uh this one's interesting and I think kind of fits a similar mold where we're talking about a really good college player and how they fit into the NFL draft. DTR, Dorian Thompson Robinson, the quarterback from UCLA, is not a project, should be drafted and treated like it. I, I see him getting drafted, but I don't think anyone ever thought that he was a – like, I don't see him as a project. You know, I think that's like – it's easy to say a late-round guy is a project, but we're talking about an older quarterback prospect in Dorian Thompson Robinson. I, I think, if anything, he's just a really high-value backup if he gets drafted. And some teams are going to deem him that way. But the one thing that needs to be acknowledged here is that oftentimes backup quarterbacks are selected to replicate the skills of the starter. So for a lot of teams, his skill set is not applicable at all. But I think a team like the, the Baltimore Ravens, if they keep Lamar Jackson, if they were not very happy with, with the results that they had with their backups and like they, so here's a really good example of why I think he might end up like on the, the Ravens roster. Anthony Brown was the third receiver on the Ravens roster. Third Anthony quarterback, Brown's mean, not a good third quarterback. Qu- third quarterback. Yeah. You said third receiver. Yeah. But like he, he's not really like, like he, what we saw from him at, at Oregon and Boston college, like the guy would, had a lot of issues. And I think a lot of people would have thought that he wouldn't have stuck on an NFL roster, but because of the circumstance, yeah. he fit the skill set and they wanted to keep him around. I think Dorian Thompson Robinson goes into a situation like a Chicago Bears, somewhere where they have an athletic quarterback. Who Eagles. A lot of re- Eagles. Yeah. And he could sit on the back end of the roster. And then if he has to step in for a game, he'll be great. But I don't I don't know if a project's the, the right way to describe him. Now, it's not a project because I think projects – I think projects – let me think how to phrase this. I think he's close to his ceiling. Like, yes. Let's put it like that, right? Projects aren't close to their ceiling. Projects still have a lot of development to go. And I was just looking at the take one more time. So is good. Not, I mean, he was a good college quarterback. I agree with that. I mean, but for an NFL, I mean, could he be a serviceable backup option in the right situation? I think you hit on that. Yeah, it's yeah. possible. It's possible. Cause I mean, Tyler Huntley just made a pro bowl, right? <laughs> which is still the funniest thing in the world, <laughs> which yeah. But I mean, so a certain system during Thompson so Robinson could probably stick. If not, I would say this Dorian Thompson Robinson is an NFL athlete. And I know some people are going to take that the wrong way that, oh, you're saying he should move to a different position. That's not what I'm saying necessarily. What I'm saying, though, is that he is a good enough athlete 
to be on an NFL roster in general. That's just what I'm basically saying here. Good at college player could find a niche role or as a serviceable backup in the right situation. That's what I see with Dorian Thompson Robinson. He's not a project. I agree there, but I wouldn't call him a good prospect either. He's a late rounds, potential draftable option as a quarterback, probably a priority free agent that could stick in the right situation. That's what he is. That's what he is. Yeah. I think that's a really, really good way to put that. Uh, Our last one is that Ryan Robert, Ryan Roberts is not draft eligible. Uh, I, I I can verify that. They are. Well, no, I mean, I was technically eligible in uh, 2013, I guess. Oh, uh, you're right. But. Oh, yeah, because you wouldn't be in the draft. You would have to sign as a free agent. That's right. Yes. So that yes. take is wrong. Nice take try. Is, take is wrong. Take is wrong. If the <laughs> if the take. if the Chicago <laughs> Bears want to draft me first overall, I don't think I'm in the pool. So yeah, it's not wrong. It's not wrong. That's a, that's a real shame. Uh, all right, now let's pitch each our own. So here's yeah. what I have, Ryan. Oh, I don't. Necessarily we, we have think... we have not heard these before. We've, we've no. said. I just want people to understand the organic yes. nature of this conversation. Yes. I don't necessarily think that this is going to happen per se, but okay. I think that there is a realistic possibility that is not being totally acknowledged. Okay. So there are a, a, a couple of very talented running backs in this class, B. John Robinson, Jameer Gibbs, who have been given first round grades by me. However, my hot take is that there will not be any first round running backs, despite so- the talent at the position. I know that's not that hot. I know it's not that spicy, but despite the fact that we've got a guy who's good enough to go in the top 10 in Bijan Robinson, I think enough teams have been burned by the circumstance of having to pay these guys. And then also some guys not really panning out that they're going to wait till the second round on Bijan and on Jameer Gibbs. I really think that that's going to happen. Joe, I thought, I thought, I thought you come a little hotter than that, man. Like, it, I understand. I get it, right? Because <laughs> no, Joe. I mean, I I get it, man. You know, you're you're betting on the fact that, again, like you just said, teams are going to rethink that process and say, I can get this guy in round two, or round three. I don't have to take a guy in the top fifteen or twenty. Like, yeah, I right. get that. I get that. Ultimately, I just think Bijan's too good not to go in the first rounds. Just could if you well, think it's hot, the second rounds, that, I would I, be like, yeah, sure, but. Yeah. That's why I think it's hot, though, is that he's so good. Like, he really should be a first-round pick. And he's phenomenal, for him to, man. For him to fall that far would be a pretty significant drop because he's that yeah. talented of a running back. So, I Who's, a, who's a better running back prospect, Joe, him or Saquon? I still think Saquon was the better. Who's the better but, running back prospect, him or Todd Gurley? Him. I so yeah, think wow he, we're, we're a little different on this one. Go ahead, because like here's my well because Todd Gurley came in with with a knee injury, so that's that's a little different. He was but so good in college. <laughs> I think so Saquon, uh, yes, he was. Saquon as an athlete and as a running back and as an impact player, yeah, was better than Bijan because he could take any play, redirect, and it's a touchdown. Bijan's different though, where like. He's got a lot of the same athletic traits, but he plays the position very differently, which is why I don't really like the, the whole Saquon comp because it's the play style is different, but the traits are similar. And they're also their size profile is different. Saquon's a little bit bigger, meatier, if anything, than, than Bijan was. It's just Bijan might have, I don't even know if it's more sustainable, but just Bijan's going to have a different impact because he's fall forward, pick up five yards because he's so strong and big. Saquon's yeah. lose three yards, gain 20, lose a yard, gain 10. He's just yeah. very, very different types of players. Can't believe you just called someone meaty on the podcast, man. Oh call man. I, I will, I will call anybody with, with big thighs <laughs> meaty. Ryan, what's your hot take? Joe, this is an actual hot take. So get your notepad out. Let's, let's actually work on these. All right. Um, the second edge off the board will be Lucas Van Ness from Iowa. Have you watched him? Yeah. You like him Good that play. much? So you would. I, I would I would take him in the back end of the first round personally, but I think that teams are going to lose their minds over Lucas Van Ness. Okay, why? I haven't I admittedly have not watched him, so I'm not gonna he's like, he's six five, he has two hundred and seventy five pounds, he has an eight pack. The dude is a ridiculously just stupidly put together athlete. He's got that physical power profile that the NFL 
falls in love with. You think about what they just did with Trayvon Walker this past year. I was going to say, year, is, this, right? is this Trayvon Walker 2.0 here where everyone's going to just get It's actually better up? than Trayvon. This kid is a better player right now than Trayvon Walker. Trayvon Walker was a higher upside athlete, though, so if that makes sense. So, now Van Ness is a good player, man. I think that he is worthy of a late first-round pick. I think he's going to be overdrafted, though. I think ultimately he goes in the top 10. I do. And I think that there's going to be a conversation between – Miles Murphy, Tyree Wilson, Lucas Van Ness. And I would not be shocked if Lucas Van Ness is that first is that second mm-hmm. guy after Will Anderson. I don't know if that's that spicy though, because I can I can kind of get behind that because you just like the guy's a great athlete, and we know for a fact Will Anderson. Like that that one's a what lot. if he doesn't go as the first edge? What if that doesn't happen? I at least la- at least last year. We had yes. murmurs that Aiden Hutchinson might not be the first guy, the first edge taken. That there were yeah. these murmurs of that, but I, I feel like no one has even brought up Will Anderson's name, and that's how we know that things are going to be fine for him. For me, or the, I don't know. I just I think you'd have to really, really, really overthink the kid to go with one of those other guys because not only is his ceiling the highest, but yeah. his floor is already higher than all these other guys. Like he's, he's already very put together and he's got a lot more to improve on. I just, yeah, I would be stunned if he is not the first edge taken. You, you know, there was a, there was a guy on Twitter the other day, Joe, that there was like a, somebody made a comparison between oh, no. v- Von Miller and Will Anderson. Right. I'm like, that's reasonable. Like I get yeah, that. We talked right? about it on like, the show. We talked about how that makes sense. On it's this understandable. Show. Yeah. It's understandable. The guy, the guy retweeted it was like, oh, Will's got better production, but he's nowhere near Von Miller. It's like a younger guy, right? So I literally quote tweeted it, or I, I think I just subtweeted it. And I just Uh-oh. said, like, I, I literally just said, did you evaluate Von Miller? And crickets, brother, never answered it. Never answered my question. Sorry, it just drove me crazy because I'm like, you never uh, even evaluated Von Miller. How are you going to say that that's unrealis- that's unreasonable? How can you say that? Like, eh, stupid, tough. stupid. Anyway. Tough scene. Lucas Van Ness, you should go watch his Ohio State game, Joe. Okay. It's it's kind of bananas, man. He put he put Paris Johnson in some bad bad positions that day. I'm, man. I'm chugging my way through. I'm I'm trying to. And this is, we'll wrap on this note. Just cut, not even really a note. Um, the way that I'm going through wrapping up the or doing the class is that like I'm trying to watch chunks of guys by position group because I noticed at the beginning, I was just trying to watch all the top guys, but. I feel like I'm a much better evaluator when I'm in a rhythm on a particular position group, because then like I watch the top guy and I'm like, I can then c- compare him to other guys in the grouping and then maybe make some yeah. adjustments later. I just, it's too hard to keep bouncing around. I don't, I don't like I get that. How, how hodgepodge my, my analysis is, but I will say it is kind of funny because like you look at my, <laughs> look at my big board right now. And it's, uh, I have like some really goofy people in my top, top 20 that are just, Obviously Give me one. Not going I want to hear one. Uh, you know, like Steve Avila in there or something? No. Uh, wait, let me. Uh, well, I need to give you one that's not totally ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> well, like Michael Mayer is number one right now because I haven't gotten to, I haven't gotten to, I haven't really done final evals on the the edge class, so I'm not gonna put them on my yeah. big board if I don't have a grade on them. Sure. Uh, but like Michael Mayer is number one. Here, here's a. Here's a really ridiculous one. Zach Pickens is at 11 because I haven't graded that many top. <laughs> I haven't graded any, any, any top 40 guys. Like I, I really only graded like 10 and I really like Zach Pickens. I had a, an, uh, an early to mid second on him. So um, I'm going to put, I'm going to put on Twitter. I'm going to put on Twitter that uh, Zach Pickens is your number 11 player in the class. 